Africa Business News, proudly sponsored by EY. Coming up on Africa Business News, Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta commissions cleaner energy, Nigeria declared Ebola free, and Mozambique takes to the polls. Stay tuned. Africa, we love it huge, we love it diverse, and its business landscape fascinating and dynamic. And that's our business here, right on your favorite weekly African business stop. We're joined by Bonnie Tunya in Nairobi and Esther Ubodaga in Lagos. We'll hear from Christine Mundo here in Johannesburg as well. My name is Victor Homoeswana, and this is the Africa Business News. Well, Mambo, Bonnie, there seems no stopping Equity Bank right now. It's still finalizing its equity, Equitel deal on the one hand, facing lawsuits on the other. It is partnering American Express. To do what exactly, Bonnie? Equity Bank has begun issuing the American Express branded charge and credit cards in Kenya. Now, this is just 10 months after signing a deal to become the exclusive issuer uh, in East Africa. But, Victor, the bank has also signed a deal to issue cards across Africa, and this is except in South Africa. The move is expected to give the bank's merchants a new stream of revenue as well as allow the bank to tap into both expatriate and spending and uh, as, the, as the demand of such products uh, is growing in the middle, uh, middle class segment in the region, Victor. And fresh from his trip to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, well, he wasn't president when he went there, but President Kenyatta has been busy, among other things, a breakthrough in cleaner energy project. This is exciting. It's not on scale, of course, of the Europe, uh, Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam, but it's a sizable power plant nonetheless, especially when one looks at how the German Development Corporation contributed, what, 70 million euros? Well, Victor, the Germans uh, might have given us 70 uh, million euros, but they're not the only ones uh, who are giving money in this project. We had the EU, we had the World Bank that also came in, um, giving in uh, different sorts of uh, funding and with also different kind of conditionalities, Victor. But the Carrier 4 geothermal project is set to inject 140 megawatts into the national grid, with the second phase in putting an additional 140 megawatts in December, and that would in fact make it, the Carrier project the biggest uh, geothermal power plant in the world, Victor. But what is more important is that uh, this project will lower the cost of electricity by up to 30 percent, Victor. So obviously there is a a lot uh, playing into that. But finally, Victor, after 10 years at the helm of the African Development Bank, it was announced that Donald Kaberuka will step down next year. Now, the FDB Board of Governors will be electing Dr. Kaberuka's uh, successor on the 28th of May of 2015 during the bank's annual meeting uh, uh, taking place in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. Now, if we take a look at his history just a little bit, Victor, when Rwandan-born Kaberuka was appointed president of the African Development Bank in 2005, he faced some resistance from his candidature. Uh, in 2010, he was re-elected for a second term, unopposed, with the suggested that he built a strong confidence. Now, take a look at this CNBC Africa interview from 2011, where he gave us an insight into some of the challenges he experienced. I think that, first of all, the African Development Bank is a model for international financial institutions mm. because the head of this institution is elected democratically, transparently, and in a competitive way. It is not so in many other institutions where people are appointed. They are very good, but they are appointed. Now, in our case, in 2005, there were seven candidates from different parts of Africa, and that is a very good thing. All the seven were capable of running the bank. Yeah. Uh, I'm not pretending by any means that I was the only one capable. Africa has enough uh, resources. Now, it turns out that uh, my opponent was from a West African country, but this was not a competition between two regions of Africa. Mm. It was two African candidates, both, I imagine, uh, very good, able to run the institution, and of course, somebody had to win. And I'm glad that it was me with a 78% uh, vote, which was the highest in the history mm. of the bank. And I think that uh, I therefore had to work very hard to merit the confidence of the shareholders. And I'm glad that they renewed that confidence in Abidjan uh, unanimously, mm. which I also think is good for the institution. But I must add this point that 
this example which Africa is giving to the world, that you must have people appointed competitively, transparently, mm. is extremely important for international governance. We are still on Africa Business News and I'm with Christine Mundua. Christine, you came from Mozambique, but it was before the elections. Elections happened last week. What's your take on what happened out there? Well, final results haven't come in yet, but from what we know from the results that have been coming in from the provinces, uh, Frelimo, the ruling party, has clinched this one again. While it is somewhat of an overwhelming majority, the party hasn't been left unscathed. We know that they have lost a huge amount of votes, and this is largely due to the fact that the country's uh, gas deposits, which have been discovered, have, of course, prompted a lot of uh, foreign direct investment. We know that they are showing very good growth forecasts. But Mozambicans remain among the poorest people uh, in, in the world, and that, that that obviously the money that's coming through from all this investment isn't trickling down to, to the poor people who are getting poorer, uh, in a sense. Well, it's still going into the big mega mining projects. Of course, we see a lot of activity there, and that's why we need the stability politically, because most of the investments that were made in Mozambique will only deliver returns in a couple of, in a couple of decades, probably, if, if we are to be realistic. But yet another mining economy in southern Africa is Namibia, and the economy seems to be stalling a bit there. Is it stalling? Should we be worried about world fourth largest or fifth largest uranium producer seeing some slowdown on the economic front? Well, based by these numbers uh, released by the country's National Statistics Agency, it shows us that overall mining production has decreased in August. Um, that's in comparison, of course, to July. And it's about a 0.6% uh, decrease month on month, but a 12% decrease year on year. Now, it is important to know that this is still the backbone of the country's economy, contributing some 13% to the country's GDP. But if you speak to the Chamber of Mines uh, CEO... Yeah, uh, Vestin Malang, right? That's it. He has a different perspective. He says, is that mining is the country's backbone and it will still be uh, in the years to come. He was actually speaking at a symposium taking place a few days ago. He went on to say that the country currently has 17 mines uh, and that three are currently being constructed. So that will be about 20 mines in the years to come, possibly uh, taking the country to one of the world's top producers. They don't say. come more bullish on mining in Namibia than Vestin Malangwa, I can tell you. You've got to meet the man. You'll be bowled over. But Rio Tinto, after exiting his operations in Mozambique, even as we talk about Namibia mining slowing down temporarily, that is doing some mining in Namibia, but he's facing some pushback from environmentalists. What's that all about? Well, the story here is that Rio Tinto is planning exploration activities to see if they can discover uh, any base metals that will be viable for commercial mining. Now, the activities uh, will contaminate soil and water potentially. It will also disrupt flo fauna and flora, and this is why the environmentalists are not particularly chuffed. But we do understand that the company has obtained or has applied for licenses uh, to do this and is currently in consultation with parties that will possibly be affected by the activity. Well, everybody who's going to mine in Africa had better know that it's not a pushover when it comes to environmental matters. That was Kristen Mondua in Southern Africa. We'll be hearing from Esther Ubadaga next as we wind down the show in West Africa. Stay tuned. Well, Esther, we have become used to melancholy when hearing news about Ebola, but this time the news has left us with some smiles on our faces. Why would that be, Esther Ubadaga out of Lagos? Well, you're absolutely right, Victor. Now, the World Health Organization has declared Nigeria Ebola-free exactly 42 days since the last new case. Now, a WHO representative at a news conference yesterday in Abuja said Nigeria's fight against the virus is a spectacular success story. However, the Nigerian government says it will maintain all existing Ebola response protocols in the country and will remain on high alert until the virus has been brought under control in West Africa. Now, the current outbreak has killed uh, more than 4,500 people in West Africa, mostly in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. Nigeria had 20 cases of the Ebola virus and recorded eight deaths. So, yes, it's, uh, it's all come as good news for us now that we're, we've been declared Ebola-free by the WHO. Alongside oil and gas electricity, it is synonymous almost with the growth of Nigeria. Every dollar invested in Nigeria has been a large percentage of it going to improving the power situation there and bring about the security of power supply. Amazing though to see that Leo Stan Eckers company is getting in on the uninterrupted power supply game. What is Xenox Electronics up to this time? I thought they only made tablet, these guys. Well, Victor, that's primarily what they do, but it turns out the company has been very busy in the last five years developing other innovative products. 
Now, Xenox yesterday launched iPower Plus into the Nigerian market to correct deficiencies in public power supply. Now, according to the company, iPower Plus's customized power engine has taken over 18 months of continuous research and statistical analysis of power perimeters generated from monitoring power conditions in different homes and offices throughout all the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria. So it's basically aimed at reducing the cost of living in the country through the provision of efficient and inexpensive power solutions at homes and offices. The iPower Plus solution will power lights, TVs, fans and refrigerators for between 12 to 24 for hours, longer backup than any other inverter in the market. So it's definitely good news, particularly for small businesses. Nigerian solution to a Nigerian problem. I like the sound of that. Gentlemen in Nairobi and the lady in Lagos, as we get to this point of the show, we ask you to pick your stock. Imagine I have 10,000 US dollars and I want to invest on the stock markets in your region. Which share would you advise me to buy and why? Who goes first? Let's start with you, Bonnie. Well, Victor, $10,000 is very tempting. Uh, at this time in the Kenyan market, I'd go for the Kenjen stock. Um, the price is at 12 shillings and 50 cents, not too bad from where it has been. This week, all we've seen it rise uh, past five percentage point. So it is doing well. Also, plus the uh, inf bond, energy bonds and infrastructure projects that are still coming in the energy sector, I think that's a definite stock to buy. You're mentioning Kenjin for the second time in three weeks, Bonnie. How about you, Esther? Well, Victor, I will go with Cement Company of Northern Nigeria. That stock has gained over 100% since January of this year. And because we know that the cement industry here in Nigeria is doing great at the moment, there's a lot of infrastructure projects going on, uh, especially at the federal level. So it's definitely a stock that should uh, give good returns to investors. So I'm going with CCNN. Energy stock out of East Africa and construction in West Africa. Of course, we close the show with a trivia. The question today is October 21st is a public holiday to commemorate the anniversary of the death of a head of state in which African country? I ask you, Bonnie and Esther, the country is part of a very progressive regional economic bloc at the moment. Who wants to take a shot? Sounds like either Rwanda or Burundi. Well, you've got to make a call. I would say Burundi. That's right, Bonnie, a member of the five-nation East African community, commemorating the assassination of his first democratically elected president, Melchior Dadae, who ruled the country for only three months. His assassination led to the death of about 300,000 people in the Great Lakes region country. Well, we hit the pause button for this week, folks. Until next week, we were with Bonnie Tunia in Nairobi, Esther Obodaga out of Lagos, and Elia Christine Mundo here in Johannesburg. Stay tuned to CNBC Africa. Back with you next week with more Africa Business News. Until then, Michelle Nabu Zwaesu.